Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos. From Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington, you'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, and welcome to Jazz Talk, a Jazz on the Tube podcast. My name is Ken McCarthy, and this is where we talk with people who are doing important work that supports and illuminates the music we love. The writers, the scholars, the educators, the filmmakers, the producers, and more. And we're talking today with the author of New Orleans Remix, Jack Sullivan. Welcome, Jack. Thank you so much, Ken. You know, as lovers of this music, we can't talk enough about New Orleans, learn enough about New Orleans, discover enough about New Orleans. It is a deep and rich place. And every time a great book comes out about the subject, I make it my business to get it and read it. And I'm so glad, Jack, that we could have you talk about this book. It's it's really, for people that don't know it yet, it is a very substantial book. This is something that you can really chew on for a long, long time. I want to make just two comments before we start about New Orleans. One, if you're a jazz fan, you somehow have to get yourself to New Orleans. <laughs> you just have to do it, just once, right? It's it's and I and I say this as a, a a New Yorker, chauvinistic New Yorker who grew up in the New York area, who just assumed that New York was the beginning, middle, and end of jazz, and how important could New Orleans be? And so when I finally got myself to New Orleans, way too late in life, but at least I got myself there, I discovered that. Wow, this is this is music heaven, and I've, since then I've been an advocate for everybody to, to get there. There's a few things of New Orleans history that people aren't aware of, and one of the things is that it's had such a profound creative impact on musicians that we all know and love, and we're not and we're not even aware of it. For example, a lot of people just aren't aware that Lester Young who's one of the key persons in jazz. I think if you take Lester Young out of the equation, a whole bunch of the jazz edifice collapses. He really he was such an essential artist. Well, he spent his formative years in the New Orleans, Algiers area. Ray Charles. Everybody loves Ray Charles. Well, Ray Charles went through a, an incredible creative transformation after his time in New Orleans. And even Ornette Coleman, who everybody associates with the avant-garde, rightly so, Ornette was, in 1949, he ran into some trouble on the road. He was stranded. And Melvin Lasky, trumpet player and a member of the Lasky musical family, invited him to come and stay in the Lower Nine. And he was there for many months. And he told me personally that it was playing in the churches of New Orleans and the church music of New Orleans that gave him the feeling that he could really play for free and get away with it. <laughs> so... <laughs> This is such a profound place. So we're so fortunate to have you, Jack, to talk about New Orleans. Let's talk about the myth and the reality. Now, the, the textbook myth is that New Orleans uh, jazz started in New Orleans and it went up the Mississippi River, and that's the origin of jazz, and that New Orleans is truly a special place. Now, other people say, well, hey, look, there, there was great music going on all over the United States, and it's it's wrong to oversimplify the jazz story with 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 that what's your comments on that president what place for us to start well i i think that there's so some myths happen to be true and this one may not be completely true but it's fundamentally true and certainly all the musicians interviewed and i interviewed many many musicians for this book they certainly believe it's true and one of the most convincing exponents of of that myth is is john baptiste who of course, plays for the Colbert Show now, but I, I, when I speak with him, he's he's in New York as as I am most of the time, but he's in New Orleans a lot too, and he's from New Orleans, and he says it's because New Orleans was a port city, and there was a confluence of so many different kinds of ethnicities there, a and b there was a need for a new kind of 
dance music in the 1890s to finally do something besides waltzes and polkas and young people were demanding some new dance forms and they didn't want different dances for Irish people, different dances for Italians, Albanians, all the different types of music. And the jazz really started out as a, a, a kind of a demand for a new, a new style, a new kind of hot dance music. And it happened in New Orleans first because there were so many people there from so many different places. Kind of the way it is now, John points out, with the Internet. It was, there was no Internet, but it was that kind of thing. And, of course, it spread other places in kind of random ways. It wasn't, there's nothing linear about it. And I think one of the things I try to point out in the book is that there's nothing linear about the origins of jazz. But there's something magical about New Orleans that many of the musicians talk about. The clarinetist Michael White is very eloquent on this subject. Just about anybody you, you talk to, Alan Toussaint, they all say there's a kind of magic that seems to kind of seep out of the streets, a kind of spirit of the ancestors. And I know that sounds silly and kind of pseudo-metaphysical, but if you're there, you know it's true. It's something palpable, and you just sense, you know, this myth has got to be true in some fundamental way. I know when I first went to New Orleans, it was in the early 80s. My brother lives in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I went to his wedding, and I'd been hearing a lot of jazz in New York because I live in New York, and I went to Preservation Hall because I didn't know where else to go, and in, in those days, it was really hard to find another place to go, and it was really a life-changing experience for me because I just never had heard anything like that. I'd heard a kind of parody of it in New York, actually, is it kind of a Xerox copy of it, but... That's when I first got this idea that what I hear in New York is kind of graduate school jazz, as I call it. And in, in New Orleans, from that very first moment in, in the hall, there was a kind of electricity and realness and exuberance to it. Plus, everybody was playing something different. It was completely polyphonic. I didn't even know that that was possible. It was really, really what we now call ensemble music. All those things just kind of blew my mind, and that's when I started coming down and coming down and coming down, and eventually mm -hmm. decided to write this book. Mm -hmm. I, I, one, one of my transformative experiences in New Orleans was hearing the Treme Brass Band, and yes. it just, you know, and I'm a guy that, you know, Cecil Taylor once rehearsed all day in the in the studio where I work. I used to hang out at Ornette's Loft on on the Bowery, and so I've seen, I've heard some music, and those guys just blew me away. Yeah, I remember last anyway. week I was I was in New Orleans promoting the book and mainly just to go to Jazz Fest and Treme was playing in DBA, which is one of the really great clubs I'd like to talk about. Mm -hmm. And Shamar Allen, before the night was over, had every single person in that place dancing. And if mm -hmm. they didn't dance, he would he would humiliate them until <laughs> you know, in a nice way until they got out on the floor and did and did a few moves. Didn't matter if they were good moves or not. And that's the other thing about New Orleans music that I just didn't know, and that is if, if it's not danceable, they have a profound indifference to it. And they, musicians tell me again and again, if it's not dancing, if people aren't dancing, we're not happy. And this is a kind this of is, participatory quality to it that you just, you just don't find in New York. You, have to, you just have to go there to experience it. This is a critical point, and but let's talk about this. You know, jazz, as you pointed out earlier, started out as a social music, a, a party music, and entertainment music. And I completely understand why certain musicians like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and others said, hey, you know, our music is serious too, and we'd like to get the same level of attention and respect that a European classical musician gets. I totally get that. And, th and there's room for that, and there's a place for that. But I think jazz imperils itself when it cuts itself off from the social party entertainment, hey, we're all together to have a good time element. It's not trivializing thing. It's not, oh, you know, we're just, oh, shucks, we're just entertainers. It's art and social awareness or consciousness or whatever you want to call it. Can you talk a little bit about that? You've already sort of mentioned the essence of it, which is that in New Orleans, the purpose of music is to bring the group together, the crowd together for a good time. 
Well, one uh, one thing that was liberating about writing this book is I, I usually write about classical music. I, mo- most of the writing I do, I mean, I'm actually an English professor, so all, so all uh-huh. of this is, is, is relatively new to me. But most of the writing about music I do is, is I write program notes for Carnegie Hall and for the Metropolitan Opera. And so it was just so liberating for me to be able to, to use words like vibe and cool <laughs> instead of words <laughs> like overture and coda and to kind of get into the feeling of something very, very different where they don't make a distinction between art and entertainment. There's no such distinction. And before Wagner, there was no such distinction in opera either. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's very possible to party and be very ser- a very serious partier. Let's put it that way. And I hear groups all the time who are somebody like Aurora Nealon, the great clarinetist saxophonist in New Orleans. She's a very serious artist. But when she plays with the, the Royal Roses, her group, everybody is dancing. Mm-hmm. And, and she's playing some very complex chord changes. The same with somebody like Wendell Brunius, who was displaced for seven years after Hurricane Katrina. And he, he came back to New Orleans because he said, ultimately, the only place that really respects melody, as he put it, is this town. And so I just had to come back here. There's, there's no contradiction between lyricism and complexity any more than there's a contradiction between serious art music and partying wild crazy music. And as I say in Preservation Hall in 1980, when I first heard this music, that became clear to me because this was very tight polyphonic music, but there was something very joyous and partying about it at the same time. And I think, I think you have those two in perfect balance, so you, you can't tell where one begins and the other ends. And when the music is imported as, as it needs to be, it's not quite, it doesn't quite have that combination. Like if you hear, I heard the Rebirth Brass Band at Brooklyn Bowl recently, and it was a perfectly okay show, but when you hear the Rebirth Brass Band at the Maple Leaf in New Orleans, it's it's mind-blowing every single time, and it's, it's because the audience interacts with the music, it's because, as Phil Fraser, who's the leader of the band, says in in New Orleans, they, they, the attitude is, we know, we know how good you is, now show us how good you is. And they know wow. the repertory, and there's a kind of interaction. And, and people are very respectful and profoundly attentive, and yet they're also having a good time. You know, that, it, it's, it's fascinating. You, just, you have to be there to experience it. There, there is a, a repertory, and it is known by New Orleanians and, and New Orleans fans who, who make frequent visits. There's a body of music that people know. And in fact, <laughs> like New York, yes. there's, a, there's a ton of songs about New Orleans. So it's very yes. interesting to be in New Orleans hearing musicians singing about New Orleans, yes. which, which is, by the way, is not unlike being in, in Havana. So many of the songs in Havana, when you break down the or in Cuba, when you break down the, the lyrics, it's like, hey, here we are singing this great music. We love it. <laughs> we're dancing hard. It's, we're having a good time. I mean, those are literally the lyrics. And when, when you learn Spanish and you finally realize what they're saying, you're like, oh, wow, this is very uh, yes. yeah. straight up. And, of course, a lot of the, the great stuff that's happening now in New Orleans is Latin. And the kind of the progenitor of so much of this music, Louis Moreau Gottschalk, who was really the, the great – sort of the first pop star in America, he played in Latin America, in Cuba. And then, of course, there, was, there were all these Haitians who, who migrated to New Orleans. And so you really have Cuba in New Orleans, too. Mm-hmm. And it's very popular just now, especially. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're all hoping that the, in the long arc of history, that connection between Havana and New Orleans will be restored. It, there was a huge amount of ship traffic and trade between those two cities, and it all came to a, a crashing halt, of course, in the early 60s. But there's a, there's a great thing from Earl Palmer, the great drummer Earl Palmer, yeah. in his biography, talks about sneaking on a ship and, and in, New Orleans, in New Orleans and getting to Havana and just just raving about the music and the, and the scene. and. There was a lot of cross-pollination and communication between those cities for, for a long time. If, you know, for instance, when you walk through French Quarter, you'll see these plaques that say, you know, this street used to be called, you know, and they give the Spanish name. 
Yes, yeah. it was. It, so the city was literally administered via Havana for on uh, about forty years, I'd say. Hey, I have a question. Since you're an opera guy, I didn't really. I, re, I mean, now it makes sense because one of the one of the great chapters in this book, which we're going to talk about in a bit, is about opera and New Orleans and jazz and how they all fit together. But I've always heard that in the old days, pre pre Wagner, that the operas were a lot more boisterous. People would, you know, during the I don't know what do they call the thing where people aren't singing but they're kind of talking they're sing songing you know they're t- they're talking but there's there's not necessarily a, a musical piece going on uh, yes yeah, so the re- actor chatif is what the technical term is okay so during the recitative people wouldn't really pay attention they'd be chatting with each other they'd be buying fruit from the vendor who was walking up yeah. and down the aisle but then when the when the the arias came then everybody would stop and yeah. really pay attention and I'm half Italian, and apparently one of my relatives, when he went to the opera, he would sing along with the arias, and it was okay. <laughs> nobody, nobody had a problem with people in the audience humming or singing, or so it was. So opera now is a, is a pretty buttoned up experience. But could you confirm or deny <laughs> that it that was, opera it was not that way more? then? Um, we we know from many accounts that it was spilling out in the streets. The way, the way we think of as jazz in New Orleans now, like Frenchman Street now, we, opera was supposedly very much like that. And some of the earliest impressions that Louis Armstrong gives us in, in, in his memoirs and his, his interviews is, is from Italian opera. And we, we know that he warmed up on Italian opera. We, we know that he loved Petrozzini and Caruso and all those, those, those great singers. And that it was an important part of his art, and he tried to, he, he wanted his horn to sound like an opera singer. And there's a certain lyricism, the kind of thing I was indicating with the trumpeter Wendell Bruni, it's the kind of open embrace of melody that really comes from opera in New Orleans. New Orleans was the great opera center of the New World. It wasn't New York, and in fact, many of the so called American premieres of important works really premiered in New Orleans, which had two huge opera companies and also entertained touring opera companies in, for, for hundreds of years. And, and, and so I think that's just in the blood. And opera people tell me that New Orleans is a good place to live because it's good for your voice because of the laid backness <laughs> of the whole, the whole ambiance is so laid back. And so there's, and, and also I, I interviewed people who told me that in the old days, people in the pit would train some of the early jazz players, and then in turn, they, they would return the favor by teaching those guys to swing. So mm-hmm. there was a lot of interplay from the very beginning between the two, the two forms. And I also it's, imagine it's true, a lot of people don't seem to know that, but it's really an important part of history. John Boutte, who's one of the great singers in New Orleans in the current scene, says that that opera is jazz's grandma is the way he puts it but that that's profound and that that really is a new information for a lot of people we run a, a website where we we put out a, a video of the day a jazz video of the day and i remember a couple of years ago i i heard this opera piece and i said guys this isn't jazz but i just have to play it because the melody is so yeah. perfect and so mm-hmm. When I when I first learned that Louis Armstrong was an opera fan, which I only learned recently, in fact I learned it last week, and then when I opened your book and and so talking about uh, New Orleans Remix, and we are talking here with uh, Jack Sullivan, the author of New Orleans Remix, you have an entire chapter dedicated to the ins and outs of this New Orleans jazz opera connection. Now I imagine that Creole musicians, I, I could be wrong, but Creole musicians would possibly have been employed in these opera houses as, as in the, in the pit. Yes, yeah. sir. I don't yes, know. Yes, yeah. indeed. And you know, and, and, and you can see if you look at the early, early jazz players that they're, it's just such a mixed bag. I mean, you have Albanians, you know, you have Sicilians, you of course have African Americans. And th- that was true, you know, in both, in, in, in every kind of music. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I mean Barry Martin, who came to New Orleans in 1960, one of the I guess he's one of the most senior players there now. He's a drummer, and you know he says that the way he put it was that we we just toss around all these different influences all the time, and we don't get hung up on who's playing in which genre. We just play whatever people want to hear, <laughs> and. Mm-hmm. 
there's actually a really great opera singer, Antonio Diel, D-I-E-L. He was an opera singer on the West Coast, and he fell in love with jazz. And to the consternation of his music teachers, he came to New Orleans and is, and is now a jazz singer. <laughs> uh-huh. and he has this huge operatic voice, and he said that his opera training actually helped him because he said a lot of jazz is acting you know, your stage presence. And he said mm-hmm. that opera training helped with that as well. And so now he's, he's become a, a, you no know, real presence. He has his own band. He sings a lot of Gershwin. He sings a lot of crossover things, but he also sings a lot of jazz that he himself has composed. And the cross currents are still very much there is what I'm saying. Mm. Hey, let's let's talk about something that is uniquely New Orleans. There are there are many things that are uniquely New Orleans, but one of them is the the Mardi Gras Indian tradition. This is something I have to confess I had absolutely no awareness of until I got to New Orleans, and then I began began to realize, wow, this is a really deep and old tradition, possibly going back all the way to Congo Square. I don't I don't know if anybody's been able to to really work that out, but it certainly is an old tradition. It it precedes recorded music, that's for sure. To tell us to people that aren't aware of this. Mardi Gras Indian tradition. What is it? What's it all about? And what are they doing? Well, musically? It, it originally was about. I mean, it's about black people dressing up as Native Americans, and it, it's an homage to to Na- Native Americans would help hide slaves, runaway slaves, and this this, as you say, goes back very very far some people say before the congo square era and it's it's called masking and every year at at mardi gras you'll have a parade of so-called mardi gras indians who will have these just fantastically elaborate costumes that they work on literally all year the, the day after mardi gras they start they start sewing for the next one and you can see a a, a very accurate depiction of it in this great tr- show called Treme on HBO that didn't have a whole lot of episodes, but it, it really is true to everybody I talked to in New Orleans who's a Mardi Gras Indian says this is a, a really, this show really does depict something that no other commercial show has ever depicted. But the, one of the things that happened when I was writing the book was that I discovered certain things that really started changing since the 1990s. And one of it, one of those things was the presence and the visibility of the Mardi Gras Indians. They were pretty much in secret, pretty much you, you would never see them except on Mardi Gras Day. And now they play a great deal all through the, the year in various clubs. They just come into the clubs in costume, and they will play the, the original music for the Mardi Gras Indians was, was percussion music, and that fused with funk in the early se- late 60s, early 70s, with with songs like like Big Chief and Ico Ico, and became a whole new kind of music. And now you see the Mardi Gras Indians a great deal. And I would recommend people who really want to experience this go down on Saint Joseph's Day. You have to look it up. Just just look it up online. You'll see it's it's different. It's in March, but you can see the Mardi Gras Indians parade and you can parade with them they're very open to that on saint joseph's day and it's an amazing experience but it's it's both a music and it's also a kind of a, a spectacle a visual spectacle it's it's really wonderful and there's nothing else like it as you say it goes back very far yeah it, the the union or the the partnership the collaboration between african americans and native americans is something that they they celebrate through through that Yes, and and it and it really cuts both ways. On, on the one hand, if a if an African American could escape out into the countryside, he could possibly find Native Americans to live with, and who would shelter him. Now, late, on, but it also worked the other way, and it was explained to me this way that if you were an African American in in the South. We ran the risk of, of being captured and put into slavery. If you were a Native American in the South, you just or anywhere in the country for that matter, you ran the risk of being killed on the spot. Yes. So it's a very important historical collaboration to our nation's soul and celebrated by, by these these, this, these groups and they have their own music, their own chants, their own rhythms. They practice every week, and then they create these, as you pointed out, these incredibly elaborate costumes, which they 
only wear occasionally, and then they many of the tradition is to dissemble them. You don't wear them the next year. You have to have a completely new suit the yeah. following year, and they're hand stitched. There's no 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 sewing machines allowed. There's actually a a Mardi Gras Indian. They call it a museum, but it's it's really more than a museum. But it's in just into the Treme off North Rampart on Clearborne Street that you can go to. You have to kind of search for it, but it's there. And there's, there's an older guy there who will give you a tour and explain everything and show you many, many costumes. And it's something that's not usually in the tourist books, but it's wor- worth seeking out. Yeah, one of the projects I'm working on, I'm trying to, there's, there's a number of small museums in New Orleans. There's the, I think they call, I think you're referring to the Backstreet Museum. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's in a former funeral home right near mm-hmm. St. Augustine Church, St. Andrew's Church, right, right, right in north of Rampart. Yeah. Also, Donald Harrison, who is a great jazz man, but also yes. an Indian chief, Mardi Gras Indian chief. His family has a museum. There's also the Petit Jazz Museum. I think that's what it's called, Petit Treme Jazz Museum. It's just one room but it has amazing things in it. And then there's the great house of dance and feathers in the lower nine. And I would love, maybe this, maybe one of your students could do this as a project. <laughs> I would love someone just to make up a brochure that idea. shows all of these little museums on, in one document that each museum could share with their guests. In other words, hey, if you go to the House of Dance of Feathers, make sure you go to the Backstreet Museum. And if you're at the Backstreet Museum, make sure you go to the Harrison Family Museum and People so on. People should also go to at the Old Mint on mm-hmm. the Cater Street, the, the Jazz Museum, where I, I actually spoke on the book last week. And there's actually there's just so many fabulous new things there. There's, also, there's a brand new room on female jazz greats in New Orleans. Oh. And including contemporary ones, and that's one of the things that I noticed changing when I started writing this book, the incredible number of female artists that started both migrating to New Orleans, like this wonderful trombonist, Har- Har- what is it, Haruka Kikuchi, who's a mm-hmm. trombonist for Kermit Ruffin's Barbecue Swingers now. And his keyboard player is, is, is actually Asian. The, the influx of, of, of Asians and female performers on, on horns which is kind of a new thing. That, that's something that's just radically changed the whole vibe there. There's a sensational brass band called the Pinettes that whenever I go to New Orleans, I go to hear them. They're out in the Seventh Ward at a very hard-to-find place called Bullet's Lounge. And, but they're there <laughs> every Friday night, and they put on a show that just, just has a completely different vibe because it's female and because they do lots of singing, unlike lots of the other brass bands. And so they, they sing as much as they play, and it's, it's an amazing thing. But it's, it's one of the things that's, that's changed that I've tried to note in the book, that I could sort of see changing. Every year I went down, there were, first of all, there were more brass bands. There were, there were really just a few prominent ones in 1989 and 1990, when I first started going down regularly. And, and by, by the mid-90s, the trumpet player, Leroy Jones, told me, he said, Jack, there's so many brass bands now, I, ca- I cannot keep track of them anymore. Mm. And, and, and now it's even, even more that way. And then, and then this incredible infusion of female players, there's a great band called the Shotgun Jazz Band with Marla Dixon on trumpet. And it's typical. And Mar- Marla's from Canada, her husband, who plays banjo, is, I believe, from Alabama. For a while, Haruka Kikuchi was her trombone player. They're all from different places. They're all from different places, and that's what's happening now. There's a huge migration of new people in New Orleans on the current scene, and it's, it's, it's upsetting to some of the senior players that I interviewed. They feel they're being threatened by it, displaced by it. These people don't really know our traditions are not respectful of our traditions. But then there are other musicians I interviewed, like John Boutte and Alan Toussaint, who said, look, this is what the city is about. It's what it's always been about. It's always about new people coming in and adopting the culture and making it their own and then creating a remix, which is why I call the book New Orleans Remix. So mm-hmm. there's a real controversy about that. But there's no question in my mind that New Orleans is about change. It's change that's layered on top of something very old or as they would put it they would just say it's all in the gumbo that's their favorite Mm -hmm. 
you know, in the gumbo, you don't throw anything out. You just put new things in. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's the way they prefer to see it. And, and this all points to the fact that it's unspoken, but, it, it, but it's maybe the essential fact. New Orleans is a really musician-friendly city. Yes. If, if you were a young guy or girl and you want to get some chops and, and you want to play a lot, I don't think there's a better place to go than New Orleans to, to get that experience. Yes, and everybody's welcomed. There are many players like the Shotgun Jazz Band. It, it has a regular gig now at Maison and the Spotted Cat, but they started out on Royal Street, just playing on the street. And and they eventually got a few gigs, which led to other things. And it is it. I don't know of any other town that's quite like that. That has that kind of welcoming. What you're what you're talking about now welcomes music and musicians. And then behind the scenes in people's houses, there's music going on all the time. So if if you can play, and you can play well with others, <laughs> you will you will make musical friends in New Orleans fast. Hey, let's let's talk about the practicalities of the traveling to New Orleans. And again, I think I know you agree, and I just want to straight state this. And by the way, we're talking with Jack Sullivan about his book New Orleans Remix. If you love this music somehow by hook or crook, you must get yourself to New Orleans at least once. It, and then once you go once, you, you may find yourself hooked. So be be prepared. You know, we're we're, have, we're conducting this interview in 2018, which is a different time than 2008, which is a different time than 1998 and a different time than 1988. What's your impression on New Orleans now? What would you recommend for someone visiting New Orleans in this area? You've already mentioned a lot of great clubs. And by the way, you mentioned some that I never heard of. So thank you very much. And by the way, that by the way, that's a big part of New Orleans. There's it's multi-layered, yeah. And I have never, at some point, I realized, wow, I'm never going to get to the bottom of this place. You know, in other words, you right. think you know something, you think, oh, I'm, I'm in now, I, I get it, and then you discover, oh no, no, there's another layer <laughs> beneath yeah. that, and on and on it goes. But for somebody that's coming for a couple of days or a week, what would your recommendations be about how to navigate the city and what to see and what to make sure they do not miss? Well, of course, I would first say please buy my book <laughs> yes. because then it will tell you a lot of, of navigational things that you're talking about. And I would, there are a couple of things that are very stable that I talk about in the book. And one is every, be sure to go to the Maple Leaf Bar on Tuesday night and hear the Rebirth Brass Band. There's nothing like it. It's one of the few stable things in the glorious anarchy of New Orleans music. It's been going since the 80s. It draws a huge crowd. It's physically uncomfortable, but it's worth it. <laughs> the last time I went there at 1 a.m., the Red Hot Chili Peppers showed up. They just simply showed up and jumped mm-hmm. up on the stage and did a gig with the Rebirth Brass Band. Mm. And I'd never heard anything like that, and you would only hear that in New Orleans. You talk about mm-hmm. a mashup. I mean, that was an unbelievably electrifying experience. But there's, it's always that way. Tuesday night, I would say go there. It's past... Tulane, it's a Uber situation basically, um, but it's not hard to get to. And I think you make, I would, I, can I just say something? Because you said something really important. Don't expect comfort <laughs> at no. the Maple Leaf Lounge. <laughs> oh my God, no, no, no. no. <laughs> but but you, you will you forget can. about how uncomfortable you are. Fast, right, but you will. <laughs> and, and we're talking about the fact there's no. Che- I, if my memory is, you're basically on your feet the whole time. It's yes. not the prettiest room you've ever seen, but it's safe. It's safe. You're not. You're not. You don't have to worry about your safety. Well, let me put it no, this way: exactly. in every city in the world, you have to have your radar up. And New Orleans yeah. is, is no different. There's there's no city in the world where you can afford to be a fool wandering around intoxicated late at night by yourself. So, you know, with with that as a as a warning, you know, just have your radar on. It's a big city, and it's yeah. like old cities. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then don't don't miss on Thursday nights at a, a wonderful place called Rock and Bowl. They always have really spectacular Zydeco music, which is not native to New Orleans. It's really from Southwest Louisiana, especially Lafayette. But it's in it's in the Rock and Bowl every Thursday night, and it's now other places too. So it kind of has come to New Orleans, and that's a really great dance experience. The other one I was just mentioning is if if you have the sense of adventure for it to go to Bullets, which is in the Seventh Ward, that's an Uber situation, and hear the Pinettes on Friday nights. And then of course there's Frenchman Street, where there's that's the new bourbon, 
every kind of music in the world is there in New Orleans, and it's only about two and a half blocks. It's an incredibly small mm-hmm. area, but there are certain things there that I think are pretty constant. I believe it's it's. Well, I'm going to stick my neck out now and just 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 say don't you know. I'm not going to stick my neck out, rather. Just just go there and look in Offbeat Magazine, look in their listings, which are online now, or WWOZ's great radio station. Either one, you'll see listings, and you can see which bands are in which clubs and go to those. Another place that's very reliable is called Palm Court. It's mm-hmm. on Decatur Street. They only have music Wednesday through Sunday nights, but if you don't want to stand in that line in preser- at Preservation Hall, which is a huge, huge line and, and very unpleasant, actually, uh, <laughs> I'm not saying don't go to the hall, go go once or twice, but you can go to the Palm Court and hear pretty much the same musicians, and it's a nice sit-down place, it's easy to get a reservation, the cover is only $5, and Mark Bro, who is the leader of the Preservation Hall band, plays at Palm Court, this is just one example, every... Sunday night, I believe. It's either Sunday or Friday, and it rotates a bit. And every Wednesday night, you'll hear the spectacular old-style trumpet player Greg Stafford Wednesday nights at Palm Court with some really great blues singing by Topsy Chapman. She's there Wednesday night. And so that's another very reliable place, and that is very comfortable. So it's you not can actually comfortable, Ken. They, they, they have they have they have actual chairs that you can sit on, and, and it's a, it, it's a restaurant. It's nice. Yeah, they have uh, wine glasses that are real wine glasses. They have yes, indeed, yeah. you, know, you seem to know it. Yeah, <laughs> preservation hall. I mean, you're right. You're going to wait online. It's just the reality. You be prepared, and you're going to sit on a bench. Yeah, and but you can also get great music in a hollowed space. And here's another one for you. Vaughn's on Thursday night. Vaughn's is. Again, it's an Uber situation. It's in the Bywater. It's a great example of a New Orleans institution, which is a, a local neighborhood bar that only has music once a week or twice a week. And that's, that's what Vaughn's has been doing since the 80s. And everybody, all the locals know about it. And you get free food there. Cindy Wood, the owner, serves really wonderful soul food there Thursday nights. And I believe right now it's Corey Henry, who's a wonderful musician, his band plays there Thursday nights. And, that you know, that can change, but there's there's always music there Thursday nights. Those are, some, those are some really good tips. And the only thing I would add to that is definitely get Offbeat Magazine. But I would yeah. also say get every free, and there's a bunch of them, free arts uh, entertainment guide that they hand out. So there's other ones. I'm drawing a blank on the name, but you'll see them. They're all stacked together. And also get the Picayune. And read everything yeah. because sometimes an amazing event will only be listed in one place. Yes. I went to, speaking of the great U.S. Mint, I went to an amazing all-day symposium on the, the old Dew Drop Inn. Yeah. Mind-boggling history. Mind-boggling. And it was only listed two lines in the Picayune. <laughs> Nobody else <laughs> even mentioned it existed. So just get a big stack of stuff. And it, to me, it's like going to uh, like the best music university conservatory on earth yeah. between, the, between the lectures and the films and the performances and the parties and the outdoor events. It's just, it just goes on and on. Um, something that jumped out at me and, and, and we should mention is you've, you've named a lot of musicians who may not have national or international resonance. In other words, we, we might have some real jazz hounds out there who say, well, I've never heard of that guy, and I've never heard of her, and I've never heard – can we talk about the – and I don't mean this in a negative sense, but the insularity of the New Orleans scene. Yes, it's, it's one of the main purposes I had in writing this book was to just put that out there, just what you're talking about, Ken, that there are so many people who are almost famous – and they're famous in New Orleans, but they're not really famous outside of New Orleans. And they're incredible major talents. And a lot of them just don't like to travel. I mean, John Butte go, goes, he has a couple of music festivals he goes to, and otherwise he stays put. Kermit Ruffins does not like to travel. These are hometown folks who really love the city. And Eddie Bo, the great pianist who passed on a few years ago, said he really doesn't think he 
performs as well outside the city. He's, he, th- he really thinks there's a diminution of intensity mm. in his piano playing, and he doesn't like playing outside the city. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there. So, so, so you have to kind of come to them. And it's just, you know, they're obviously Dr. John has huge, huge resonance all over the world. You, you say Dr. John, people know who he is. Wynton Marsalis, but, but Wynton Marsalis lives in New York now. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I think there are a lot more Leroy Joneses, who's one of the greatest trumpet players I've ever heard. And I'm astonished how many trumpeters I run into in New York who've never heard of Leroy at all. It's more likely you're going to be a Le- Leroy Jones then you're going to be an Alan Toussaint. And mm-hmm. of course, Alan Toussaint, in the last years of his life, lived in New York. So, mm. yes, I think that's another reason, just what you were saying. It's important to get down there to yeah. hear, to hear these, these, these extraordinary musicians. Because there's, there's really two parts to, to the life of a musician. There's the music and there's the business. And they're very different things. Mm-hmm. And not everybody is enthusiastic or even equipped to handle the business side. And, and the business side is touring. It's being in a different city every night for months on end. Yeah. And that, that's, that's just not a pleasant way to make a living. I mean, it, it may yeah. seem glamorous to us on the outside. You know, I'm in Paris today and London tomorrow. But, you know, after a couple of months, it, it gets old. And, well, one and, thing that happens is, and this is one of the, few good things about the great flood you know Katrina which is a lot of musicians were displaced and they started doing gigs especially in New York and they got used to New York somebody like Kermit Ruffins he really likes New York now Mm -hmm. and Devell Crawford lives right up the street from me now in 94th Mm -hmm. Street he's he fell in love with New York and so you do have more um, New Orleans musicians in New York now. Uh, Henry Butler, spectacular pianist, lives in New York now. Henry is blind, and he just told me it was easier for him in New York to get around. And you can hear him a, doing a lot of gigs in New York. Um, Herlin Riley, the drummer. Um, I'd like to talk just a bit about rhythmic. I guess you just call it rhythmic displacement in New Orleans. But, mm-hmm. but Herlin has kind of displaced himself. He spends half the time in New York. And, and, but I, when I was in New Orleans last week, he was playing in New Orleans with Jermaine <laughs> Basil. So there, there is more of that now. You can hear more of it. And if you go to a site called nolafunk.com, they will give you a whole lot of information about New Orleans music in New York. And it's a pretty cool site. Oh, that, that's that's a great resource. So if you're not yet ready to go to New Orleans, but you're in the New York area or you're going to find yourself in New York, definitely, yeah, definitely go to nolafunk.com. Mm-hmm. You know uh, it, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Good. In fact, my first exposure to, to New Orleans music, I lived in San Francisco for almost 10 years, and there was mm-hmm. a place on Geary called the Boom Boom Club, and there were just some young guys, this was in the 90s, and there were some young guys that came through. I don't know who they were, but what two things amazed me about them. One is they created this amazing part, party atmosphere, mm-hmm. and two, they were unbelievable virtuosos. They're quoting Thelonious Monk, they're doing, you know, they, they, their musicality and their music, their chops were unbelievable, and yet the whole place was a party, and that was sort of preparation for me for when I finally got to New Orleans and, and realized, yeah. oh, there's a whole culture that's dedicated to this. Hey, let's that's disclose something about, about weather. Yeah. Let's disclose something about weather. I don't know about you, <laughs> but once May starts rolling around, New Orleans is a little bit too much for me weather-wise. Now, some people have different tolerances for, for hot weather, but we should probably tell people that basically from around May till November, yes, it's one of the hottest places you'll ever be. Yes. People just <laughs> run from one air-conditioned place to the other. <laughs> And, it, and it's humid. And, and I, I remember I had a friend from Brazil who, who was a filmmaker, and she was going to uh, Louisiana as a, on a project in the summer. And when she came back, she says, that's the hottest I've ever been in my life. Yeah. So if you like – now, there are people that love hot, steamy weather. And if you do love hot, steamy weather, you will get it in abundance during those seasons. But – on the on the flip side of that, it's a great place to spend the winter. The magnolia trees start blooming in February. Yes, it is. It's just it's just lovely, lovely weather. Now you well, mentioned that when I go yeah. every year, I go in January, ah. and I've been doing that since 1990. And you know, you never know what it's going to be. It can be 70 degrees one day, it can be 40 degrees another day, but it's sure. always kind of moderate. 
and it's the beginning of Mardi Gras, so there's a little Mardi Gras buzz in the air, but it's not crowded with tourists at all yet. But they're mm-hmm. but it's starting up, and and you can mm-hmm. kind of, you know, you you can you can you can go to Twelfth Night, you can you can see it starting up, and all the groups that you'll hear, you know, at, at a a spectacle like Thursdays at Jazz Fest, all the local groups, they're there all the time. So you can hear them, and there are not many tourists there in January, so you can go to all these clubs that I've been talking about, and then some, and just walk right in and have a great time. So that's that's my recommendation. And, of course, the city can always use a little business in January, so it's good for them as well. Yeah, and I believe, I forget the name of the holiday, but the carnival season really begins in January. I think on January 6th, it's Three Kings Day or what is it? It's called Twelfth Night. It's called Twelfth Night. Okay. And that's when the cake, is that that when the king, okay, so there's a, so New Orleans has a, it's a really good time to go to New Orleans, I think. New Orleans has a million and one idiosyncratic traditions and one of them is is king's cake. And so you'll, you'll see these mountains of king cakes everywhere you go starting around January 6th, 12th night. It's till and tomorrow. you got to buy, you know, you buy one and it's, you, everyone's got to get one. And it's, there's a lot of, a lot of things like that in the city. Now you, you mentioned, I think before we started recording that you bring students sometimes to New Orleans. Do you still do that? Well, that's the origin of this book. I started bringing students. I became the director of the American studies program here at Ryder university where I, where I still teach. And I noticed colleagues bringing students to seeing some of the great canyons or some of the great museums. I mean, I thought, why not do a trip to New Orleans? Because <laughs> I'd been going there a lot anyway, and that, that's how it all started up. And so I've been doing this trip since 1990. Mm. And so, and, and it got me here every year, dependably. It was just a, a ritual. And that was very helpful to me because I could see the kind of the, the sense of discovery in my students because they'd never seen anything like New Orleans before or heard anything like New Orleans music, just kind of experienced that excitement, that kind of epiphany experience with them year after year and kind of see things through their eyes. And that's, that's how I noticed so many things changing. And then Jason Marsalis actually told me, Jason is a, a great drummer told me that he said, hey, man, things really started changing about 1990. And I thought, oh, I actually blundered into something here. I, actually, <laughs> I, guess, I, guess, I guess it's right to start this book in 1990. And one thing I wanted to mention, because it's very important, is there's a kind of rhythmic tension where somebody will be a fraction of, of a second ahead of everybody else or a fraction behind everybody else. Like Jermaine Basil who is like 80, oh my God, she's probably 85 years old now, is such a brilliant kind of push-ahead singer. You have to really push to keep up with her. Or the mm. drummer Shannon Powell's the mm-hmm. same way. And I heard a lot of musicians talk about this, that it's what gives New Orleans that kind of excitement and euphoria, which is John Baptiste calls it a euphoria, that you just don't get anywhere else. And a lot of people told me that they think it comes from the whole parades tradition, where the person at the very front of the parade is going to be a fraction of a second <laughs> different than the, the drummer at the, the back of the parade. Oh, and that it, right. It, and, and I've heard musicians say, like Larry Seaberth, the, the pianist in New Orleans, I always go hear Larry Seaberth. He says when he goes to L.A., he always tries to get them to do that, but they just can't do it. They're so, they're so precise and so on top of the beat all the time that it's a little bit dull and mm. a little bit mechanical. And that, that was a revelation to me. I, did not, I knew there was something different about, the, about New Orleans rhythm, and apparently that's, that's what it is. Well, you know, t- taking this full circle at the beginning of the call, I talked about the fact that Lester Young spent mm-hmm. some of his formative years in New Orleans, and in his reminiscence of that time, he specifically said the parades. When he heard a parade, he dropped everything and he ran to be yeah. part of it. And that's where you would have heard. And if every, anybody's never been involved in one of these parades, it's exactly right. They're you know they're not sit, they're not stationary all together on a line. They are moving, and there's some yeah. guys in the back, and there's some guys in the front, and there's there's also the crowd, come, you know, moving at different speeds. 
And of course, Lester Young was famous for the way he played with time. And he is something he might have picked up as a young boy in the streets of New Orleans, as so many great musicians yeah. did. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the book again is New Orleans Remix. Listen, if you're a jazz fan, you've got to know New Orleans. And step one, I would say, is this book. This book will give you a glimmer of what you're missing. In fact, more than a glimmer. You're, you're, you know, the, the chapter alone, on anybody who's an opera fan and a jazz fan, I don't know how many of, of, of us are there. <laughs> but if, if you are, this book is, is absolutely a must. But if you're just trying to understand what's the big deal about New Orleans, if you're preparing for a trip to New Orleans, and I would even say if you've been to New Orleans, and, and this is another phenomenon, I've met so many people that, you know, they dipped into New Orleans for a couple of days, and I, I could put myself in that category because I actually did visit New Orleans in 90. I didn't get it. I was only there a couple of days. I didn't have any guidance, and I was like, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is if you are knowledgeable and you can spend some time and you can go prepared, you can get you can have a very profound musical, cultural, and I'm going to say spiritual experience in that most unique of of American cities. And Jack Sullivan's covered it beautifully in the book New Orleans Remix. So, Jack, any parting words? Is there any way that people can sign up for your your trip if they're not a student at Writer? <laughs> they can always they can always email email me at sullivanja at writer dot edu. sullivanja at writer dot edu. I also have a website. It's just jackrsullivan dot com. And yes, we've had people come who were not students in the class, and and a few musicians who came because I just wanted to sit in because New Orleans is all about sitting in. And they had a great time, so absolutely. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for the time. Thank yeah. you for adding this book. I, I know how hard it is to, to, to finish a book and get it between two covers. It is, a, it is a big undertaking. And now all of us who love this music and love New Orleans and, and want to share it with other people have, have a great reference, to a tool to help make that happen for more people. And I'll just leave us with this again. If you love jazz, figure out how you can get yourself to New Orleans. You will never regret it. And make just be careful because, as Alan Toussaint says, there are people there who came and loved it and said, I'm going to stay a little bit longer. And all of a sudden they looked around and said, hey, it's been 10 years now. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, thank you, Jack. And we'll, we'll talk soon again, I hope. I hope so. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos. 